much of the world do you think we can see in visible light? The answer is about 0.0035%. That's crazy, right? That's just a very tiny portion of the electromagnetic spectrum that is light that's visible to our own eyes. Everything else is energies of wavelengths that are not visible to the human eye and we need special equipment to detect that. So if you want to learn what else is out there besides the visible region of the electromagnetic spectrum and how we can use all of it to study objects of cultural heritage, then stick around because in the next few minutes we will talk about the entire electromagnetic spectrum. The energy that we can detect with our own eyes is a very tiny portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. I keep saying electromagnetic spectrum, but what is that? The electromagnetic spectrum consists of all the electromagnetic waves of all possible energies moving through space at the speed of light. Now you probably wonder what are these electromagnetic waves? Electromagnetic waves are composed of oscillating electric and magnetic fields as you can see in this figure. The electric field, the one in blue, and the magnetic field, the one in red, are perpendicular to one another and perpendicular to the direction of propagation of the wave. These waves travel in vacuum at the speed of light and they carry electromagnetic energy. Their wavelengths, defined as the distance between two successive peaks of the wave, can be very short or very long or anything in between. The shorter the wavelength, the higher the frequency of the wave and the higher the energy of the electromagnetic radiation. You can see this clearly in this figure depicting the entire electromagnetic spectrum moving from very high energies at the right side of the spectrum to low energies at the left side. Let's go now on an adventure to explore the entire electromagnetic spectrum. It's an exciting trip from very high energies to low energies. So let's get started. Let's begin at the right side of the electromagnetic spectrum. These are the gamma rays and they are the highest energy waves of the entire electromagnetic spectrum. That means they have the highest frequency and the shortest wavelength. They are produced in radioactive decay of atomic nuclei and in nuclear explosions. Even though we can't see them with the naked eye, using specialized equipment, we can detect the gamma rays produced by grand events such as supernova explosions to smaller scale events like the radioactive decay of radioisotopes. We'll talk about radioisotopes in a future video. For now, think of them as unstable states of certain elements. In cultural heritage, the gamma radiation can be used to determine the elemental composition of different artifacts. That's because each element has a different energy signature in the gamma ray spectrum. Moving to slightly less energetic electromagnetic waves, we find the X-rays, which are also very high in energy, but not quite as high as the gamma rays. You may be familiar with X-rays from the medical field where X-rays are used to acquire images of your bones. Another familiar application of X-rays is in airport security where the contents of your luggage are scanned with X-rays. Let me know in the comments below what are some applications of X-rays that you know about. X-rays have high applicability in cultural heritage. We can use them in X-radiography to obtain images of paintings in X-rays. This can sometimes reveal paintings that are underneath the visible layer of paint. X-rays can also be employed in cultural heritage through a method called X-ray fluorescence or XRF. This is by far my favorite method that is used in cultural heritage. Using XRF, we can determine the elemental composition of objects of cultural heritage. This can help us identify the materials which were used in creating those objects. And knowing the chemical composition of objects of cultural heritage can help us identify the best conservation conditions for these objects. We'll talk a lot more about XRF in a future video. But for now, let's move on to the next region of the electromagnetic spectrum. The ultraviolet or the UV region. 
This is the region between the visible and the X-ray regions of the electromagnetic spectrum. Probably the most common topic where UV comes up is the UV rays that we receive from the sun. On one hand, this UV light is beneficial because it helps the organism produce vitamin D. On the other hand, overexposure to the sun's UV light can lead to sunburn or more severe consequences such as skin cancer. So be careful with the exposure to UV light, whether that's coming from the sun or from artificial sources like tanning beds. In cultural heritage, UV lamps can be used to examine the surface of art objects. For example, they can be used to detect retouches and restorations of art objects since those are done on the surface of the art object. This way, through the details revealed in UV light, we can learn about the history of the object. Next is the visible region of the electromagnetic spectrum. That's the energies whose wavelengths we can detect with our own eyes. There are many sources of visible light. Some of these include the sun, the aurora borealis and australis, or the fireflies. In cultural heritage, in visible light, we can obviously observe and admire our favorite works of art, which in my case are all the Impressionism paintings. But visible light can also damage objects. That's why you see certain objects like old books and parchments in museums that are kept under dimmer light. Next comes the infrared or the IR region. This type of radiation is lower in energy than the visible light. Remember that the energy of the electromagnetic waves decreases as we move from the right to the left of the electromagnetic spectrum. Together with the energy, also the frequency of the waves decreases while the wavelength increases. In the infrared region, the most familiar application is the TV remote. But it can also be used in thermal imaging, which works by detecting the radiation with infrared wavelengths, which is emitted by hot objects, including the human bodies. This is very useful currently during the COVID-19 pandemic to detect high temperature in people. In cultural heritage, IR can be used to identify the chemical composition of art objects. And infrared images can be used to visualize the sketch layers, which are beneath the paint layers that are visible to our own eyes. This way, we can see what the original sketch looked like. And by comparing that to the final product, we can see if the artist changed his or her mind while creating the painting. At even lower energies, we find the microwave region. This is where our microwave ovens work, but they are also used in communications and radars. In cultural heritage, microwave treatment of artwork can be used with the disinfestation from various biological agents that are infesting that artwork. And finally, the radio waves at the very left of the electromagnetic spectrum. These are the least energetic electromagnetic waves. Some of their most common applications are in radios, communications, and air traffic control. One of my favorite applications of radio waves is in the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, or SETI. This is a project that uses big radio antennas to detect signals from outer space. The signal is then analyzed for any patterns that might indicate intelligent communication from someone from the outer space. Unfortunately, no luck so far. But I'm hoping that one day in the future, E.T. will call. Until then, let's see how radio waves can be used in cultural heritage. And this is where I spend most of my time when I do my research in cultural heritage. It's a method called Nuclear Magnetic Resonance, or NMR. You might recognize the acronym from my nickname, Neta NMR, which is where you can find me on social media. This is a method that you might have heard of from the medical field. There, it is known under the name of MRI, or Magnetic Resonance Imaging. It is used to acquire images of the human body. Both in NMR and in MRI, we use magnets and radiofrequency coils for analysis. 
In the future, I will dedicate several videos to NMR. So we'll talk about the details of the method in one of those videos. Here, I will just mention some of the applications of NMR in the field of cultural heritage. These include revealing the stratigraphy of paintings, studying the aging of heritage objects, or monitoring the water penetration in wall paintings, which can lead to their deterioration. And that's it! We've explored together the entire electromagnetic spectrum and how the different electromagnetic waves can be used in cultural heritage and in our daily lives. I hope you enjoyed learning about all these different applications of the electromagnetic waves. If you did, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe and hit the bell button to receive notifications on future videos and please share it with your friends who might also enjoy learning about cultural heritage and how the electromagnetic waves can be applied in the field of cultural heritage. And if you want to get personalized emails with my newest content, then make sure to sign up on my website using the link in the video description below. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time. Until then, enjoy exploring the world in the visible region. Bye!